morning meetings because I know we all have somewhere we need to be. Um, I will start by saying that it is November 13th and this is our Friday morning COVID check-in meeting that we have been doing for several months now. I'll start by reading our vision statement. The Ashland Public Schools cultivates the academic and social emotional growth of each student through a supportive, collaborative, innovative and challenging environment. Students will develop into motivated, resilient, lifelong learners who embrace their role as responsible contributors to a global community. This meeting is not being recorded by WACA Cable TV, but Mr. Adams is recording it and he will get that to um, the appropriate place where uh, the community can watch the meeting later. Our order of business this morning is the same as it has been essentially every Friday morning. Our call to order, opening procedures, agenda review and adoption. We'll have time for public comment. Administrative items include COVID-19 update, COVID-19 travel policies that we've been talking about. Uh, second reading here, Thanksgiving break, extended for remote only, phases, models of learning, status of athletics, season two, winter sports, and then we will adjourn. Um, I will just take a roll call and just ask you to confirm everybody that you're okay with this order of business. Mark Terry? Here and present, yes. Kathy Bates? Here and yes. Paul Kendall? Here and yes. Aaron Williams? Here and yes. And uh, apologies, I can't get my camera to turn on right now. Excellent. Thank you. We know you're here. Um, so we will start <laughs> by asking if there's uh, anybody here from the public who would like to make a comment before we start uh, our agenda items. And if you are, please just unmute yourself or raise your hand. Let me know that you'd like to offer some comments. Now's the time. I have, oh, wait a second. I have a comment. Okay. Uh, I am Tr I'm Tristan Davis. Just identify yourself for everybody else when the community watches it later. Right. So I work, I'm an employee um, at Ashland Schools. And um, it's kind of weird to have public comment at the beginning before you guys all talk about everything, because I don't want to assume what you're gonna think and what you're gonna say. But I just wanted to say that I appreciate um, the position you guys are in and the fact that you have to make decisions about our school and our community um, and you have pushback from our governor who pretends that um, he's locking, starting to lock down the state but and not including schools in that um, plan. And I know there's a push for the, from the commissioner for us to be, to stay open and be fully open. And um, it's really hard for me to kind of hear that when I watch the news and I see that we've just had two really, really unbelievably high days for positive cases in our country and the state. And I'm, I'm wondering whether, um, at what point does, do we switch from having the mindset of opening schools for kids and what are we doing for kids and then versus looking at, at as a public health um, crisis because it is schools are part of our community they're a big part of our community and to think that um it's uh, schools are an isolated kind of um insulated area that there really isn't everyone keeps saying kids aren't getting it they're not spreading it but that's just not a metric i'll believe until i actually see the numbers because testing the kids would show us that um so anyway i'm just throwing it out there i know it's a tough it's a tough thing that you guys are doing and um, I, I feel like in my head, I'm gone, I've gone past the point of the desire to really have the kids in school because I do want the kids in school, but I really am wondering with all the numbers going up, how safe, how safe that is. Thank you, Tricia. Um, I have a feeling that you'll probably hear some of us um, address the, uh, the governor's position and, and some mm. of your other questions during the meeting. I appreciate the difficulty <laughs> having to communicate in the beginning of the meeting, but based on what you said, I think we'll be talking about some of your concerns. Okay, great. Yeah, so thanks, Jim, um, having heard that, and I know that you have other things planned to share with us today. Um, this would be a good time for you to fill us in on, on what's going on in your end. I just wanted to make sure there was no one else. Sorry, Laurie. Well, I'm sorry. That's Anybody all right. Anybody else from the public that would like to share? Don't see any hands raised, but certainly you can unmute yourself and let me know you're here if I don't see you. Great. Okay. Okay. Go Thank ahead, Jim. Thanks. So, uh, as typical, when we start the meetings, I'm just going to share the dashboard um, with folks. Um, now that the state is actually 
holding true to their word and posting things on Thursday evenings, um, you know, we'll, we'll have those out and this will be shared with the community. It has been updated a little bit for a few different uh, pieces of data point. Um, and thank you to Erin Williams and uh, she and I spent Veterans Day pulling this together, uh, trying to make it a little more uh, user friendly for some of us uh, to look at some of the data. So let me share this with you. <clears throat> and let me just move this around a little bit so I can see it myself. Jim, do you want me to walk through some of the changes? Sure, that'd be fine, Erin, yep. Sure, okay, so in the incidents rate by week, which is the week by week graph, yep, that Jim's hovering over right now. What I did is I did two things. One, the red ones are going to be the top five times uh, for our town, and those will shift as we have more incidents that go you know, in the 20s and higher. Um, and so now you can see which weeks were the top five weeks since we started counting. And the red line is the median of the top five. So as you can see, there's only a few uh, weeks, and, and Trisha, this kind of goes to what you <laughs> were just saying. Um, there's only a few weeks that are above where we were at in the prior week. And that just having it being colored and having that reference line makes it a little bit easier to point out our trajectory um, and where we are sort of compared to the peak of the spring. Um, and you know, this could shift to a point, like we hope it doesn't happen, but this could shift to a point where the data coming in the next six weeks starts to all turn red because it's now higher than what we were experiencing in April and May. So that's the first piece. The second is we added this yellow um, side uh, horizontal bar below the school age children. And what this is, is the quarantine students by building and as a percentage basis of the population of that building. So that one should be um, pretty straightforward. On the Tri-Valley League, I've eliminated the incidence rate for the towns because we weren't really using those data points. And so this is just their, um, sorry, I eliminated the positivity rates. We're just using their incidence rates now. And this axis will fluctuate week to week. Um, when we started this, everybody was pretty much below the yellow. And now everybody's pretty much above the red. So um, it would not be a fair comparison to look week after week um, as the, at the same because we're needing to allow that access to flex because the numbers are changing so drastically. So just to be aware of that. Then we have the three more data points at the bottom, which are teachers quarantined, um, APS students quarantined, and then symptomatic versus asymptomatic, which is um, Audrey, Ed, and Jim, uh, or, uh, Audrey and Ed giving Jim that information based on their contact tracing efforts. Hey, Aaron, just real quick, uh, this just might be a little, the formula might need to be updated. Your red line of the incident rate by week. Mm -hmm. So that's the median, right? The it's five, the median top of the top, no, it's the median of the top five. Right, median of the top five can't be the second to highest. Would have to be the middle one. We'll get into that. Yeah, we'll look at that after. So it needs to be the one. It needs to be the next data point. It means there should be two above it and two below it. There's one on it. That's why, I think we have five. So there should be two, one on it, two above it, two below it. That's how okay. I mean, I use the median function with that Excel, so I will look at it later. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, but but what I want to point out more, you know, importantly is I think there's some useful stuff in here that we talked about last at last week's meeting about, you know, the asymptomatic versus symptomatic, um, looking at, uh, you know, how is it impacting the schools in terms of who's being quarantined uh, and, and how is that impacting the, the absentee rate? And what does that mean in terms of being able to function as a district, um, you know, in terms of this is just students, but then we also have the teachers. How is that impacting the day-to-day the -day operations? And what I want to be clear is just because you're quarantined doesn't, it's not indicating that um, these are folks that are positive. Um, um, they could be the close contacts and, and 
we're finding the close contacts uh, that are being tested are, I think, 98% negative, Ed, if, if that's um, pretty close to the statistic. Um, but what you'll notice here is that our cases per 100,000 this week uh, went down significantly from the prior week. Um, you have to remember, uh, we've said over and over here that this is a data point within a community. We are looking at what is happening within the schools on a daily basis. And in order to make sure that we're accurate with our data, uh, remember the state data is also about five days behind ours um, in terms of what we're presenting. We're presenting actual data through yesterday morning. Um, and the state presents theirs through uh, the prior uh, Sunday uh, morning. So we've just got to be careful when we're looking at state versus adjusted data. Uh, our, our, our positivity rate is 3.96 this week. Um, and you'll notice that uh, that being said, uh, we're, we're increasing uh, the number of, of positivity from the prior week um, by almost 1%. Uh, yes, the governor and the commissioner certainly changed their metrics. Um, I, I put it on this screen uh, as, reference for you. We have not adopted this. Um, and again, I want to be clear uh, with all those listening and who will, who will eventually listen to this. The metrics is a data point only, singular. It's one piece that we're using. We're not saying this has to be how we approach things every single week. Uh, because again, we could have an outbreak in uh, an assisted living that might put us in the red. That's not impacting the opening of schools. And while yes, it's a community uh, health concern, uh, we wanna be very thoughtful of how we're approaching it in, in the buildings and in the district. And um, I, I certainly can, can say when we're looking at the Ashland High School quarantine, we can say, oh, it's 27 kids. It's 4% of, of the population that has enrolled in the schools, meaning we've, we've removed all the kids who are remote only. Well, I can also tell you those numbers are split 50-50, just about, um, with uh, regard to uh, cohort A and cohort B. So it's not all the same kids and all the same groupings. Um, and a number of those kids will be, um, or staff will be coming off from that um, as well. So, so Jim, just a quick question on, yeah. on that. Um, the teachers and students quarantine are only, did you just indicate that, that we're only talking about the ones that are in person or are we talking about all our, all our students? So say that again, Paul. I'm not understanding. You, you, what, if I'm inferring what you just said, that the 71 students are all in-person students. Or correct. Is that is correct. Them? That is correct. Those There's, are. I have removed all the remote students from. Uh, excuse me. I think there might be one remote student in there. There's one. There's yeah. One. I think there's one in there. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I, I guess I'd, I'd ask the the group whether we wanted, you know. Uh, whether the, the knowing of all of our students is important or breaking it out. But uh, the other question I had, Jim, was does our, our quarantine numbers exclude isolated numbers for top positive cases? Does it, yes. or does it include positive cases? No, it's exclude. Okay. Yeah. I had one question on that data point as well. Are the um, figures regarding quarantine students and staff the, four, the same as sort of the 14 day average, or is that like current as we sit here today? It, it's current as of yesterday. As of yesterday, okay. And that number will significantly change in the coming days. Meaning up or down? Because of information that you're yeah. aware of. Yes, it should go yeah. down, Mark. Okay. Yeah, it would be going down based, again, yeah. remember, we, we're going back in time. Um, right. And, you know, we're giving you the most accurate um data as of yesterday morning as of yesterday morning yeah. yeah so i mean i guess as, as i look at the, the there are three data points i'm looking at i guess when i make this next comment and that one is the rolling 14 day case average the other is the um 14 day school age cases and then yep. the quarantine numbers and you know certainly it looks like you know nobody knows what tomorrow is going to bring but if we don't see another outbreak in the next week these numbers should come down because we see a pocket kind of ending around 11, four, five, six. Yep. And then the, the new outbreaks have been much smaller since the seventh. 
doubt it's going to stay that way, but you know, there's there are a lot of cases there, and I assume that the quarantine numbers roll with that you know, in many respects. Correct. Is that, is that a fair assumption? Ed? Yeah, yeah, and can, so let me, I want to just make a comment here too. Um, so if you notice that we, right now we have 65 open cases, just right. so you all know, I, I compile the data for Jim um, at 7 a.m. on Thursday mornings. Since then, just so you all know, we've had seven cases come off, four of which involve school-age children since yesterday. Now I, but we did receive six new cases since 7 a.m. yesterday, but none of them are school-age children and affect our schools at all. Thank you. So, so again, I think it's imperative that as we're looking at data, um, that we're trying to make sure. Hi. Oh, someone needs to mute there. Um, okay, good. I think it's on here. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I mute her or did fall someone? Um, Cause I'm not looking at the screen. I, I just muted her. Thank you. Uh, so I, what I would say is that, um, again, we're looking at this data every day and we're having conversations with our health professionals to determine what is the right thing to do. Um, and, you know, at this point, you know, we've been, uh, I think, diligent in, in our efforts uh, to, to maintain at least the hybrid model. Um, I, I will say, I'm gonna stop sharing here if this is okay. Um, I would say to the point that, that Trisha made as well, we are not beholden, and I, and I would say this very strongly, uh, to the governor or the commissioner's comments. Uh, if this community feels as though we need to make an adjustment, uh, I believe the school committee and the health professionals here will say, Jim, we need to make the adjustment, whether we believe in what the commissioner and the governor have put out in their most recent um, color-coded dashboard um, and I think that's important for everyone to know yeah I mean I, I guess I just want to take a minute to echo that thought process because I think from the beginning we you know we've always focused on trying to do what we think is right um, and you know relying upon health professionals I think um, I don't know what the state's doing you know that the, the I get very skeptical when, when somebody comes up with a set of metrics, when those metrics say something they didn't want it to say, they change them. Yep. Um, you know, it, that, that to me um, represents, a, it makes everything they're doing lack credibility. And so I, I, to the extent that we even started looking at those metrics, um, which I think we very quickly found, you know, quite frankly, were not the best way to make decisions because they didn't tell the story behind it. Um, and I think um, with Jim, your help, Ed's help, and Audrey's help in particular, um, you know, you've been able to give us the story behind it, which really makes it easier to make decisions, at least for me. Um, but, you know, to the point that Trisha made before, um, you know, I think it is, I, I don't have much faith in what the state's going to say. You know, if they're going <clears> to <throat> at some point come in and say all schools should close, well, you know, we'll have to do that. My understanding is they're basically telling us we shouldn't have done what we did in the spring when the governor basically ordered the closure. Right. So go figure, right? Um, you know, I think what I, just to comment sort of on where we were briefly last week and the week before, you know, what I lean towards is if we start to see evidence of spread within our school district, um, and it doesn't have to be substantial necessarily, but when we see evidence that it really is transmitting from one kid to another. And I think in some respects, I don't want to say more importantly, but I think the place where that evidence might be shown is with staff because most of the kids are asymptomatic. Um, staff are more likely to show symptoms if we start to find that that's, um, that's occurring. And I think we really need to take a hard look at what we're doing. But I, it doesn't sound like we're there right now. Not I, for me. Right. And I would yeah. say we have not seen that transmission from a student to a, to a staff member, that the staff, uh, any quarantine or et cetera, um, would have happened outside of our system. Can, can I, I do wanna echo and just add a, just a little bit to what Mark just said about the state's announcement recently and um, to Trisha's comments in the beginning. Um, we have said since day one, we were going to break the numbers down as they relate to Ashland and 
also include the other factors that we think that are important that we've been talking about all along. So, you know, whatever they say or don't say, we've kind of announced our process in the beginning and we've stuck pretty true to that process. However, um, you know, it does sort of complicate things when a statement comes out like that from the, you know, authorities that, again, like Mark said, seems um, a little bit not based in reality. And I wanted to pay, pass along that. I didn't do this research myself, but Tracy Novick, who uh, works for MASD and is on a school committee in Worcester, um, broke down that statement, um, particularly some of the medical studies that were cited in making the statement. And there are flaws and problems with all of, all of those um, references. And I can't say right here what they are, but really just saying that it's kind of suspect to, to me, anyway, it sounds like to Mark as well, that um, the metrics suddenly change, even though we all see what's going on around us in the country and we see what our own personal circumstances are and it doesn't line up. So um, just for whatever it's worth, I just wanted to, to reiterate, because again, we've said it from the beginning that we're always going to do what uh, makes the most sense based on what we know is going on right here. Can, can I can I yeah. just add one more comment yeah. too, yeah. which, um, <clears throat> you know, there's always those scenarios too when Audrey and Jim and I talk, you know, every day. Um, and, and sometimes we're conflicted. And But I will tell you one thing that, which is a benefit for us is Audrey and I have direct access 24 hours a day to the state epidemiologists. So whenever we have a concern mm -hmm. or we're not sure, Audrey and I, we do a conference call with the state epidemiologist and we run the scenario by them just, and it helps us sometimes make our decisions. Yeah, and, and you know, to, to address some of the other things that, that Trish said, we're not beholden not only to what the state says, or we're also not beholden to some metric we attempted to put on a piece of paper months ago, or even as we updated these, met, these metrics, these new metrics that are coming out. And, I, I won't get into whether they're flawed or whatever. You know, I, I sympathize with the state's position that there, that there's all sorts of, there's 351 communities, right? And some of them are doing an amazing job um, at trying to be effective with a, a hybrid model and things like that. And others are not doing as well. And, um, and it, it's tough to come up with policies and things that, you know, bring everyone up to a certain level and standard. So um, what we're gonna do is what we continue to do is to figure out what's in our best interest in keeping the school open for as long as we can, where we believe that keeping it open is not presenting in it itself, you know, a public safety risk, right? And to address particularly one of the things Trish said, Ed, the work that Ed, Audrey, you know, Amy Childs, all those people are doing, is the reason we can confidently say that opening the schools is not contributing to the spread. That contact tracing, it's not a data point that can be published to you because of confidentiality, but those individuals can provide us and guide us on what they're seeing when they're doing this incredible work that they're doing, which takes an enormous amount of time. So, you know, we, we always say this, but people, when you make poor decisions and they have to contact you and start doing contact tracing, the amount of hours you've just cost them uh, is amazing. So, uh, it, 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 but that is the reason we can make these, these decisions. It's not some crude data point. Uh, to Jim's point, we're getting from Ed, Audrey, and the team what the data actually means. We could have an outbreak of 20 people, but if it's in three households that traveled together that they've already been isolated, well, that shouldn't impact our ability to open schools. If the, that 20 was spread among 20 households and we're not sure where it came from, well, that would be uh, you know, a different context and data point that we would need to determine whether, hey, do we pump the brakes? Do we go remote for a week like we did when, we, you know, when Ed and Audrey and the team needed more time to contact trace at the high school and middle school when, when that came about. So um, we're not just going off some data points on a slide, but uh, we're going off guidance 
from the people that are doing the work and understanding where it's coming from and, and how it's transmitting. So uh, I'm confident in saying that, you know, despite the increase in numbers in, in Ashland, keeping the schools open so far has been the right move because of the context that the team has been able to give us. Yeah, I'm just going to uh, say, I'm going to, yeah. No, I'm just going to jump off into my other call. I will try yeah. to come back hopefully when it's over. Okay. But, uh, see you in a little bit, hopefully. Thanks, Mark. Okay, Jim, back to you. Okay, no, I, I think, I mean, I have not much more to say other than, the, you know, a message I'll be sending out to the community today is, again, strongly, um, you know, discussing how, you know, we're not just falling prey to the, the commissioner and the governor's words, uh, and nor, um, are we blinded by the fact that, that we could potentially have to shut down at some point uh, based on the numbers. And we wanna focus on what's right for Ashland. Uh, I'm more concerned, honestly, with um, personnel uh, that, that our school buildings uh, can't function and operate because staff is out, not necessarily because of, of students, um, but if, if those numbers continue to escalate in a particular building and we can't operate uh, because one, there are not enough substitutes to, uh, you know, if, if someone has to quarantine or is isolated for 14 days, how are they going to teach their class? Uh, three, um, you know, we, we're still struggling hiring people. Um, we've got a number of open positions in the district that I've advertised all over the place. We're not the only district struggling with this. Every district in the Commonwealth is struggling with trying to find sufficient amounts of employees. Uh, that, to me, is more of a risk then uh, in my lens to shutting down and having to go remote than uh, our process we've taken with, uh, with contact tracing and, um, and our positivity rate and the number of students, et cetera. So uh, that's a real concern for me. And it goes back to, again, folks doing the right things um, and asking people to make a sacrifice. Uh, Laurie, you've talked about this over and over. Um, I know from our perspective in my house, uh, we've got all our extended family live near us. Um, except for my family in Vermont. We're not getting together. We're staying with ourselves for Thanksgiving and for holidays and weekends because it's the right thing to do at this point in time. And that's what we continue to ask our, our community members to do. I won't belabor that. We can move into the policy. <laughs> so. Well, we were going to, I think Thanksgiving is uh, on yeah. the, the list. We started that conversation last week, and I don't know if this is going to be you, Jim, or Audrey and Ed to kind of. Work I'll just I'll just bring it up. I mean, we yeah. again, it was more of a starting point of a conversation. Um, we are still not. I still don't have any data that supports that we should be shutting down for the week after Thanksgiving. Um, I'm not necessarily. I'm not recommending that. I'm just saying that that it's a conversation we should have because other districts have had that conversation. Um, and is there a fear that that families are not going to adhere to the the physical uh, you know distancing guidelines and and the s small group gatherings? Yeah, it's probably going to happen. Uh, there's no doubt um, that some are going to say, you know what, the heck with it. We're going to do what we want to do uh, and put a community at risk. Um, but do we shut down uh, the system for a, a small group of folks who do that? I don't know. I don't have that answer for you. Um, but I think our process of still even during that Thanksgiving week, we'll be monitoring. We're still going to be collecting the, the COVID data. We're still going to be seeing how it's impacting and could impact our schools. I would, I would certainly hold, um, the res I'd, I'd reserve the right to say that Friday morning when we have um, our meeting after the Friday after Thanksgiving, if those numbers have exploded, I reserve the right to say, hey, we need to go remote. Um, and you know, as much as we want to give families and, and, and educators the, the appropriate time to plan for it, um, sometimes making a premature decision um, isn't the right thing to do either. So. Audrey and Ed, if you want to weigh in, um, please do yeah, so. Yeah, I would, do from a you know, public health point of view, I, yep. I, you know, even though it might seem premature in the moment because today everything is okay, I mean, from a public health standpoint, we have anything to gain by being proactive and taking some space during that time? 
I mean, I, I, again, I, I agree with Jim. I mean, I think we need, just need to look at the numbers that week. And um, just, again, because, you know, we have a lot of those quarantine numbers are also going to be coming off next week. Um, I, I think it's a wait and see. <clears throat> I'm on both sides of the fence, too. I, part of me says, let's keep it open and see how we're doing and watch the numbers. But the other part, it worries that we're not going to do the right thing, we as a community. So. I mean, if, if, if my conversation with Jim and what I'm hearing from, it sounds like we don't make a decision because of Thanksgiving. We treat Thanksgiving like we would anything else and make a decision based on the data we have coming into it and, and exiting that that week is. Well, that I think kind of the what difference, hearing? Paul, is, is that it's, it's not just another normal week. It's a week that calls for gatherings. And now that we've been through Halloween and we've been through some parties that we know about and we've been through, you know, we know people are gathering. So I think it's based on, on, on what we've seen so far and based on what Thanksgiving actually is, I think we can assume that we're going to have some problems that we're going to have to deal with afterwards. And it's just the extent of, of how bad they are. Right, so uh, I, I think you totally misunderstood what he just said. So what I hear people why say- Why don't you clarify is, that for me, please? What's that? If I misunderstood what you said, why don't you so, clarify it? So I'm, I'm, based on what I've had conversations with Jim, what he just said, what Audrey and Ed just said, is that we're going to not, we're, we're not hearing a recommendation to, because it's Thanksgiving, make a preemptive decision, but just like we're doing now and maybe we do it more frequently even we, we look at it more frequently and maybe jim or ed, and ed can, in audrey can say hey, let's have an emergency meeting to discuss it if the data comes up but make it based on the data and not just that it's thanksgiving and be proactive and, and be preemptive um with it because right so i understand it perfectly what you said and so what i'm saying back to you is because it's Thanksgiving and we know what happens on Thanksgiving and we already know what's happened on some of the other events leading up to now that um, encourage gatherings, is there, it's just a question. I'm not saying that I feel that that's what needs to happen, but it's not a normal week. We know what's going to happen. I, and I think we know it's not a normal week. I'm almost of the, and having thought about this more since last week, it was my initial feeling. I, I guess initially I felt, yeah, let's close because that gives a long period of incubation if something were going to happen, yada, yada. But I also think it's a more of a permission slip to not be conscious of your community and try to do something and then make sure you fall within the window and then get back into school. And I think, um, I actually think that not closing um, puts more onus on the families to take their responsibility more seriously. Anybody else on that? I mean, it doesn't sound like there's a, a, a majority of people or a recommendation for us to decide today, um, but certainly food for thought. Yeah, no, I think we continue the conversation. Yeah. I, I'm not, again, I'm not saying, I'm just not recommending it today. Uh, I'm saying we need to look at that data throughout next week and we need to continue to, to analyze it. Right. Um, it. It could be potentially, Lori, not after the week of, after Thanksgiving. It might be the two weeks after Thanksgiving right. that, that right. we find out that, yeah. that things have hit, right? So now we're, you know, we're, we're struggling with, with that component of it and and i said last week too if, if we do this for thanksgiving then we're doing this for all vacations and um in december break etc i just think we'll set right. and another question for the health professionals is too and again like i said i'm not really advocating for anything i'm not sure what the right thing to do is either i just want to understand um you know the different pros and cons to, to either choice i haven't even heard that taking a week off is going to <laughs> prevent anything. Um, right. If that's the case, where we're going to see things two weeks later, if, if, if taking the week off doesn't help, then what's the point of that? 
Yeah, and, and I guess my point, Larry, is everything that Jim and Audrey and Ed are saying is let the data decide. And the cause of the of a data spike might be Thanksgiving, but we're not making it. We're not going to make a preemptive decision. We're not giving a recommendation to make a preemptive decision because of Thanksgiving on, a, on a, by itself. It's going to be data driven. Right. And to, to Jim's point, that's the other thing I was going to mention is like, and if we're doing it for Thanksgiving, you know, we're doing it for everything. Then, right? if we make the what, what's going to what's going to change if we make a, a preemptive decision for Thanksgiving, we'd make it for you know, Christmas, New Year's break for, you know, the two breaks in February, March, we'd be doing the same thing, right? Right. No, I totally do understand that. It's just a matter of how much of a spike we're going to get from these events. I agree. And, and that's and why where we're at when it starts. And that's why I think we watch it. You know, um, Kathy made a point to me last week, too, um, about you know, if we go remote that week after Thanksgiving, the, the, the cohort B groups miss four consecutive um, opportunities for in-person learning, right? They miss the Thursday, Friday already, and then you go remote the following week, and they get two less days of in-person as well. So, um, you know, just trying to, to think about those things as well, which I hadn't even considered. So. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like there's there's no need for any action on that today, and we can move on to policy, which is our second reading. And Paul, um, thank you. We got your edits, and it seems like all the concerns were reflected in the the new document. So I'm wondering if anybody has any additional comments or concerns. Did you all have a chance to read the updated policies? I know Mark's not here, uh, and I don't know if you heard from him individually, Paul, on anything. Yeah, can I, oh, sorry. Yeah. Can go I ahead. jump in, Paul? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, what I wanted to say, Lori, is the, the policies themselves, uh, Mark Terry did provide us uh, input, uh, and, yeah. and the policies that you have reflect that input. Okay. Uh, and then I took that input as well, and, and I discussed it um, with Michelle um, uh, Smith, and, uh, so the policies do represent those conversations um, uh, and, and are, um, you know, for me, I, I think are in an excellent position. It, it puts some uh, work that I will have to do with my admin team for some procedural things, um, which is what, where we wanted it to be. And uh, um, especially with our, with our uh, families and students. Uh, so as soon as we can get a policy squared away uh, and approved, then I can send it to families and I will, then meet with my admin team to get the procedures uh, squared away for our, for our families that, that may uh, not adhere to the executive uh, order. So. Okay, so thank you. So you're recommending them and you've um, talked it through with Michelle, the attorneys have looked at it, all school yeah. committee members have had a chance to weigh in. Yeah. So unless there are any other comments or concerns, we should be able to, uh, the second reading, so we should be able to vote those policies today. Yeah. So, so Lori, do you want yeah. me to bring them up and just point out the the changes from last time? Sure, Paul. Uh, Thank you. All right, let me. I'll bring up the clean version and just talk about. So let's see. Um, let's start with. So you should be able to see the clean version of the employee policy. Is that true? Yes. yes. Um, so there was some minor uh, changes in this uh, uh, in this top paragraph. Pr primarily, you know, we do have staff that are uh, remote, uh, teaching remote only, and things like that. So, uh, kind of specified more um, uh, of those things in both there and the covered person. Um, and for the high risk. Uh, I'm sorry for the for the covered travel. Just added some language in there um, for covering the exemptions that exist. In, you know, more aligning with the state's uh, travel order and the ex exemptions there, so people weren't conflicted about, hey, I'm I commute from this state. What's going on? Uh, uh, things like that that are covered there. Um, we added this section back, and this is. Um, uh, what uh, Jim referred to that he discussed with uh, Michelle, 
but just asking um, the staff members that are going to plan to travel to to let the principal know. So if there are, if there is going to be any absence relative to that travel, that they can make accommodations. So it's not a requirement; it's it's a request. Um, and that's the primary changes to this policy. It was relatively minor changes. Um, so that, that was probably the most significant one is, is adding that notification back in, um, you know, just to help us make sure we can operate and, and provide the services uh, in the event somebody needs to be absent. Any questions on that policy? That was a pretty light changes. No, looks good. Does anyone want to make a motion on that one and we can just do them one by one? Uh, I move that we uh, accept the or approve the Ashland Public Schools uh, COVID travel policy for employees as presented. And I'll second that. Thank you. And all in favor, Paul Kendall? Aye. Aaron Williams? Aye. Kathy Bates? Aye. And I, for me, Mark is absent for this vote. And then the next so, one, Paul. Um, so, Lori, I don't know if there's a stand. So, one of the things we didn't, I didn't look at with this is how it fits into our policy manual as far as its labeling. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that that's something we'll, you know we could probably. I'm assuming we can leave up to Jim to do. Um, he obviously needs to put in the bottom of it the. Um, but not this one, I'm sorry. Uh, the student one has some updates that he'll need to make. But um, so I, I guess what we'll, I assume it's okay to leave it um, up to Jim and and, uh, and Karen to work with MASC to put it in the right spot. And because we typically have labels on, on our right. policies, and this one's a temporary one, I don't know where it would go. But yeah, we can have we can have Karen reach out to MASC to, to get a, a you know, ASC or whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to label it DTRT, do the right thing. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I like to rather when we talked about the other day, too, but <laughs> yeah, that I won't share. Um, <laughs> all right. So moving on to the other one. Uh, this is a student policy. Um, and then hold on, let me just bring up the red line version of that as well. Okay. Are you able to see the clean version of that policy? Yes, Paul. Yes. Okay. Um, so same for covered travel. We added the, the language for the exceptions um, there. Uh, return to school. Um, uh, this, is, this is an addition to Mark. The good catch on this part is um, with athletics, it's not just participation, but if you plan to attend in any way, shape, or form. So if you're one of the parents that is going to show up, um, this also applies to you. You're not allowed to come if you haven't complied with the policy. So before I just said participation in athletics, but we're also talking about the people that will attend the athletic events. Um, so here's where here's the notification kind of changed. Um, uh, we took out some of the detail and and just to give you the history on the, the first iteration of the policy was really just a, a capturing of the conversation that Jim, Ed and Audrey and I had with what they want to see. And now we can take that out and, and Jim can uh, maintain that, the, that detail in a, in a separate document. Um, but one of the things that uh, I added after uh, Mark's comment was just this last part as set forth by the superintendent to make sure that the policy grants um, uh, Jim the ability to set the parameters of that notification. Um, and that was my concern about removing it is just um, someone being able to tell Jim that, hey, you went, you went too far. You did, well, what gives you the right to do this? And we want to make sure the policy gives him the proper authority to do those things. Um, so then, um, so we had a little bit of update, there's more verbiage um, for most of this, uh, that we did modify, you know, we, we were more consistent with um, the phrasing and capitalization and things like that. Um, uh, we, we did kind of simplify this uh, paragraph here um, uh, and, and just uh, just kind of 
didn't talk much about the form and what it's going to contain. Left that up to uh, Jim to create that form. And I think that is probably the biggest. And then this was uh, the, the procedure statement was up in the in the notification section, moved it down. So not a ton of changes. I also in here um, uh, on both of the policies, I did put the um, the location and the travel order for those exemptions because uh, they don't they put them in odd places. They, they put it, they're put in the quarantine requirements and testing options section, which doesn't really scream out, hey, that's where the exemptions are. So highlighted them there. Um, so Jim and Karen will need to both label this policy and also then put the references to um, the notification and compliance forms that Phil, uh, that his team will need to create. Those were the, the primary changes uh, to this policy. Thanks, Paul. Any questions or concerns or comments on any of the changes? No, it looks good. Thanks for all, yeah, all that work. Separated everybody's concerns and, yeah. um, and cleaned up all the issues. So um, who has a motion for that one? Uh, I move we approve the Ashland Public Schools COVID travel policy for students as presented. And I'll second. And all in favor, Kathy Bates? Aye. Paul Kendall? Aye. Aaron Williams? Aye. And I for me, that passes. And Paul, thank you for all your, yeah. your work on that. That was a lot of work and we appreciate it. And, um, and Jim, thanks too yeah, for, you know. Yeah. Talking with Michelle and, and getting, having the lawyers look at it too. So, and, we'll, and Mark we'll Terry, so. Thanks. Yeah, we'll get this out uh, to the public today. Uh, the staff one to the staff, and the public um, one to the to the rest of the uh, community as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I will meet with the admin team to and Audrey and Ed actually to w work through some of the the procedural pieces that we want folks to follow. So, but Excellent. that's good. Thank you. Thank you. So next phases models of learning, Jim. It doesn't sound like you're recommending any changes. Nope, nothing for this week. Um, you know, we're saying status quo in the hybrid for this week and then continue to monitor the data. Um, we'll continue to monitor over the weekend. I hope Audrey and Ed don't have to call me for a weekend. Um, it would be nice, um, but I doubt that's gonna be the case. Um, <laughs> they they, want, they want to talk. Yeah. I'm just, just so you know, it's, it is Master's Sunday. So, you know, it's, it's a sacred day for me. Right, give the guy a day off. <laughs> But no, other than that, we're good with, with where we are for next week. And I, I do want to emphasize next week is at, at, uh, Kelly and Dave confirmed with me uh, just by shaking your head. It's the, it's the changing of the new quarter. Um, today's the last day of the first quarter of the year, by the way. Um, so we're done 25% of the year. Um, we and, made it. Yay. And, and <laughs> next week, our students begin with their new set of classes. So I, I hope it is, you know, I want to make sure that we'll follow the data. We're not doing it just because they're starting new classes, but it would be great to have students meet their new teachers, get, get situated um, before the, the Thanksgiving break, which is the following mm -hmm. week. So um, let's hope we can, we can do that. Let's hope the data lets us do that next week. So. Right. And thank you to all of you for getting us through this, this first term. It really is quite the achievement. And especially if you look at what's going on around us, um, we really are. Uh, have a lot to be proud of here in Ashland. Thanks to all of you. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. nice. And when you look at some of the numbers locally around us, I mean, Medway's down, Hopkinton's down. Like there, there are some trends locally that where other communities are seeing not the spike that we saw, but we can actually attribute. We know where a couple of our spikes started had. It had nothing to do with Ashland Public Schools, believe me. So, yeah, but it is what it is. So that's where our numbers are. Yeah, I mean, just to impress upon anybody that might be listening or watching at some point, I mean, your actions absolutely have an impact um, on the conversations we need to have, the workload of the individuals we've listed out before, the COVID task force and, and all the people doing the contact tracing, your poor decisions impact their personal lives, they're, 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 you know, they're not just doing this nine to five, right? They're, they're working on the weekends. And, um, you know, I've had personal experiences with people that, you know, and, and this is important. When you get tested matters, you know, I've, 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 I can tell 
people with personal stories about people who had close contacts, got tested, but they got tested too early. Then they developed symptoms, didn't tell another family that they were interacting with, who then tested positive. All right, so if you're symptomatic, it doesn't matter whether you think it's for something else, unless you're sure, you, 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 you gotta do the right thing. Uh, we're seeing evidence of, of people making those poor decisions and even if we're able to keep the schools open, you owe it to the other families you're going to be interacting with in some way or shape or form. You know, be cautious. It's difficult. It's difficult to everybody. My, my kids haven't seen their, you know, my, my wife's uh, uh, mother in over a year now because of this, right? Everybody needs to make sacrifices. Uh, and, and we need to start doing the right thing because we have too many people making poor choices and impacting other families and, 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 and a lot of people. So it, your, your choices do have impacts. Um, even if you're not a high risk for a large impact, you're impacting the community. We need to make good, good choices. Thanks, Paul. And now we have athletics and, and uh, some information about the uh, winter season. Uh, I don't know if Steven is still on. Oh, um, I yeah. <laughs> um, you want me just to take it or? Yeah, I, I also put it on Wednesday's agenda um, for the, the winter um, component, just because I know the MIA is putting out actually some comments today. Um, um, I was in a meeting with them last yesterday afternoon. So I, I think some more information is going to come out from the MIA, hopefully today or maybe next week. But Well, let's start the conversation yeah. just for anybody who might have sure. tuned in yep. since it was sure. on our agenda. Yep. All right. So um, I'll start off by saying this, this weekend um, is the final weekend of the fall one season. And um, I do want to make sure I say this publicly. I and we should be so proud of our student athletes, our coaches, um, the other communities that we're working with. Um, the fall one season went really, really well for all of those who participated in it. Um, and it, it was not an easy task, but it certainly – um, it certainly works. So thank you to everybody. Um, in terms of the winter season, um, we have gotten guidance from the EEA, which is sort of the first step that sort of puts different sports and risk categories and, and whatnot. Um, at this point, like Jim said, the MIAA is meeting to come up with what is really going to be viable options for the winter season um, statewide. Then after that happens, we will meet as a league, come up with, you know, another sort of proposal, much like we did for the fall. Then it will be up to the individual communities within the league to see what works for us or for them. So there's a number of steps that we still have to go through, but we are certainly um, working on it and waiting um, for, for that information. The current start date is still listed as November 30th. I anticipate that being moved back um, at least one week. So, um, but it's still listed as November 30th um, from the MIA as of 824 this morning. So um, that's where we're at. But again, um, fall, fall one season went great. And thank you to everyone on this call and, and everybody else in the community because it was fantastic. Hey, Stephen, do, do you have an idea when, sorry, Lori. No, go ahead, questions, comments. Uh, Stephen, do you have an idea of when the 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 league will then have the, you know the the time frames for those conversations subsequent to the MIA? I do. So um, by today, what was supposed to happen was the individual sport committees were supposed to present their modifications to the sports medicine committee of the MIAA. After that, so next week, the Sports Medicine Committee and the COVID Task Force, the MIA, will present to the Board of Directors for a final approval of what will be offered or could be offered for a winter season statewide. So I anticipate by the middle to the end of next week, we would know from the MIAA what is viable and what can be um, offered. Then the TVL athletic directors um, will we'll have something within, I'd say, two or three days of when that um, is presented to us to bring back to our communities. So potentially something out. Um, something End of the following week or the beginning of the, of the next week, yes. Okay, so, so, so toward, towards the end of the month, we should be having, able to have a meaningful discussion about what uh, we think is possible or not possible. 
Yeah, that's what I anticipate as of what I, from the information I know as of right now, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Lori, it's Mark. I just want to say, um, if we're asking the minutes reflect they came back at about 8.25. In case you couldn't see me on my screen. <laughs> Uh, Mark, while you were gone, uh, we voted the policies, uh, and and I, we all heard that you had the opportunity to give input on that. So hopefully, I'll set with what happened there. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, yeah. Paul, Kathy, Jim, for putting in the time to pull that one together. Both yeah, of them. Thanks for the input. Uh, I think yeah, you had some good, good feedback. So. Um, any questions on athletics, Mark? We're just about to wrap up the meeting, and athletics was the last topic. No, I, I caught the last couple of minutes of what what Stephen offered, but I don't want to ask any questions. It's going to cause people to repeat anything, so I'll leave it be. Yeah, it's on the agenda again for our next meeting, so you will have the opportunity to do that then. I, I'll also say, I again, as typical, I am in contact with superintendents um, that we're competing against Norton this weekend in Medway, and uh, you know, Superintendent Baeda. Uh, and uh, Superintendent Pires, we're, they're on board with us playing as well. So I just like to connect with them to make sure that we're all on the same page, not just the athletic directors and principals. So. Hey, Jim, as, just out of curiosity, has any of the other superintendents expressed concern about our spikes um, relative to, to? No, because they, they actually um, follow along with, with a lot of our emails and, and we communicate on a regular basis about what are, what's happening with our cases. Uh, in the community. So um, similarly, they're looking at their cases in communities and saying, okay, it's not school related. This is why we're still open. So, right. yeah. okay. so nice job, Stephen, to everybody um, uh, pulling that off in the fall. Yeah, you know, the certainly there's Thank a little you. more concern about internal um, winter sports, but we'll see. So. One day at a time. One day at a time. Any other comments or questions before we adjourn? Or updates, Paul? I don't know if there's any updates about the building committee. We can. Um, no, not, not, not for this call. Not today. Okay, excellent. Um, who's got a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll second. All in favor, Kathy? Aye. Mark? Aye. Aaron? Oh, Aaron had to leave. Um, no. And yes, I yeah, have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thanks. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. Mr. Kendall, will you send me a Word version of those? Copy, clean copy? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>